All right, are we ready? Can people at home hear us? Can we get a thumbs up? <laughs> we're getting a thumbs up from inside the room, which is people saying here they can hear us, but are people at home, we're on board, are we ready to go? Yeah, we got a thumbs up. We've got a thumbs up. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome this evening. Um, just before we start, I really want to say a big thank you to everyone who's here, to everyone online, to everyone who's come to the previous sessions that we've done as well. Um, the response has been wonderful and it's great to see so many people coming out to learn to work together and to think together and to really just, you know, participate in our community together. You know, it's something that I find um, really important. I'm sure many of you will know that, hi Naomi, nice to see you. <laughs> um, I'm sure many of you will have seen the original um, flyer that I put out um, with reference to this series and we had four different sessions and three of them we'd sort of given what the um, session itself would be and the fourth we didn't and my reasoning with that was even from that time people were sort of asking to do a session on termination of pregnancy they wanted to hear what um, Jewish sources had to say on this um, difficult and sensitive and complicated topic. Um, my personal reservations in this was why I didn't include it straight away. And I really, my thinking was I didn't want to do a session unless I thought I could do it right and I could do it well and I could do it in a way that would be appropriately sensitive. Um, and I, I hope that that's come across with all of the sessions that we've done. But for this session, you know, I'm conscious of my limitations um, as a man, and I'm also conscious that, you know, a lot of the sources, the Jewish sources are also written by men. Um, and that means that um, the voices of people who would be experiencing terminations wouldn't be included if that was the only voices that we had. So to try and counter that, I've done two key things. Um, one is in the very first set like box of sources that I've brought, those are two series of article, one's an article and one is a podcast where it's women who are religious, um, from women talking about their experiences of termination and, you know, what sort of emotional decisions went into that, what the backgrounding was. And I, you know, I highly, highly encourage um, people to take a look at those resources. I found them really interesting and um, really important voices that um, unfortunately we're not going to be able to cover um, explicitly in today's conversation. The other thought was, um, in line with everything that I am not an expert in, I am not an obstetrician or gynecologist, but we have someone who is. <laughs> this is a uh, very pri privilege today to have Dr. Danielle Quitner with us. Danielle, do you want to um, introduce yourself? What do you do? Uh, thank you so much, Avi. Uh, thank you so much for having me today. So my name's Danielle. Um, I'm an obstetrician gynecologist. Um, I work in both the public system and the private system. Uh, my public appointment is at Monash Medical Centre in Clayton. Um, so my role through the public system is mostly obstetrics. Um, and um, so that involves um, so lots of teaching and antenatal clinics are looking after women in the pregnancies and um, birth unit. Um, and then my role in private is mostly obstetrics, but also some gynecology. So um, looking after women at all stages of the life cycle um, and a lot of sort of pregnancy care and also decision making around that and then uh, birth and postpartum and everything that comes with it. So Danielle's an excellent person to have with us today to um, keep this conversation going and like I've said in the previous sessions you know as well as the people who are sitting here there's a lot of expertise and knowledge and thoughtful opinions on the other side of the Zoom camera. So if people um, have questions, have comments, have thoughts that they'd like to share, you know, please, please, um, we'll try to make space and include those as well. So before we get into some of the halakhic background, Danielle, can you tell us for a little bit of context and comparison, what are the laws at present in Victoria? Okay, so I won't be able to cite any legislation because I did do a year of law and it was the worst year of my life. But <laughs> no offence to any law, it's a diet of boredom. Um, but, <laughs> no, it's really good, it's important. Um, but basically, Victorian legislation um, caters for um, that terminations of pregnancy are permissible pretty much the whole of pregnancy, really. I mean, there are obviously 
specific situations in which something is going to be um, managed and discussed and counselled. But um, pretty simply, um, with certain um, restrictions in terms of how it's accessed, um, a pregnancy can actually be turned. way in which you can turn out a pregnancy differs. So for instance, early on, medical as well as surgical options are available. So medical, when we talk about that, it's usually using medication. <coughs> and surgical options are mostly to do with um, the, the woman. And I will say, just to be as um, politically correct and inclusive as possible, I'll refer to um, pregnant people as women, um, but mostly I'm referring to someone who has a uterus, so um, not so much how they identify. Um, so the whether the woman actually goes um, to sleep and has a surgical procedure, which is called like a curette, um, that generally can be offered, I mean, technically that can be offered later in pregnancy, but um, the law doesn't really get involved in how that's done. It's more in terms of medical safety and skill. After 24 weeks, um, generally if um, a termination of pregnancy is to proceed in most um, settings needs to go through um, a, they call it the ethics or termination review committees so like an ethics committee that usually has um, multiple medical practitioners usually a member of the community and sometimes an ethicist as well um, just to discuss the complicating factors that are usually involved and usually in that situation we're talking about um, a medical abnormality, like a fetal abnormality. Sure. So one of the things that um, I learned, I, I did a master's of public health, and one of the things that they mentioned in that context was that laws are sometimes really counterintuitive. And so, you know, we're hearing that the law in Victoria is that um, with certain safeguards and in certain circumstances that there's no hard limit, there's no upper limit on when in pregnancy people can access a termination and that's the law in Victoria laws in Australia are all state by state um, so it's not specific that what's the, the reality the legal reality in Victoria is the same elsewhere but one of the things that I found that was really counterintuitive and interesting is that ironically by not having an upper limit what some what was mentioned to me was that by not having an upper limit people aren't forced to make decisions earlier and what, I run, what happens is that there are actually fewer terminations when there's no upper limit. And the reason that I'm saying that is to say that one thing that we're not going to try and do today is talk about what should be the law, partially because of factors like the things that are not counterintuitive happens, but more because questions of what should be public policy are a much more general set of questions. And I think outside the scope of what we're going to be able to cover in a session like this, because of counterintuitive elements like the one I mentioned, but really because it's just too much and we're not going to be able to touch on, you know, the questions of what Halakha says and then what should be um, a law in a place like Victoria or anywhere else in the world are fascinating, interesting, but just a little bit too much. Um, how about let's maybe keep moving and start making our way through our source sheet. So I think one way that I've heard um, so Jewish sources that talk about termination of pregnancy framed is that there are really two strands within Jewish texts, two strands that sort of exist a little bit in tension. And I've tried to um, isolate them and label them, you know, section number one, and then we'll see section number two over the page. So section number one, we're seeing that there are a series of texts that talk about life beginning in utero. There are a series of texts that talk about, um, and those can be everything from like Sukkim in the Torah all the way through to um, like halakhic texts, some of which we've encountered um, previously, and all the way down to contemporary poiskim who are really viewing when is life beginning? Life is beginning in utero. Life is beginning before birth. But like everything in our tradition, like all of Jewish texts, there's not one thing that's said. There's lots of different things that are said. And in tension with those texts that are talking about life beginning in utero and the associated implications, there are texts that talk about life beginning at birth. And then there are a whole different set of implications. 
So I think that's kind of where we're going to go. We're going to first talk about the texts that position life as beginning in utero and do some thinking about the associated implications. But then we're going to think about the um, alternative strand of texts, and then we're going to do some thinking about the implications of that. So it's all going to be a bit interesting, and we'll see how we go together. But for our first source, we've got a possible, which is coming from Beratius. And this is coming from the section where Hashem is talking to Noah. So this is in the stage within the Torah where there's a sort of humanity that's being addressed rather than specifically the Jewish people. And what are we seeing? But for your own lifeblood, I will require a reckoning. I will require it of every beast. And of mankind too. Miad ish achiv edrosh es nefesh ha'adam. I require reckoning for human life of everyone for each other. So what are we seeing? We're seeing this sort of general idea, and this is something that we encountered in a lot of our other sources in our previous sessions, that there's a valuing of life, number one, and number two, that, you know, people shouldn't be going ahead and taking life away from anyone. Now, this is the bit that's going to become interesting to us, and this is the bit that I've bolded. Shofech dam ha'adam, whoever sheds human blood, ba'adam damo yishafech, by human hands shall that one's blood be shed. So that's another way of saying, don't murder. Don't murder. That's one way of saying don't murder. Ki b'tselem elohim asa et ha'adam, because in the image of God, mankind was made. Va'atem pu'uravu, and you should be fruitful and multiply. Shirtu ba'aret uravu ba. You should abound on the earth and increase in it. So we're seeing pu'uravu. So what we're seeing here, the way that I'm sort of interpreting it and understanding it, is that there's a general um, ideological understanding of the role of humanity and the role of mankind on the world is to populate the earth. And that there's an aversion to doing things that will negate that. So that's why, you know, we're saying that essentially don't murder. That's kind of the basic level of understanding of this text. Are we all on the same page about that so far? But another thing that we know about our tradition and about our texts is that if a text can be understood in a complicated way, we're probably going to do that as well as the simple way. Because why not? Because we're sort of getting a lot of information coded in texts. And Something that I sort of have learned the hard way in these sessions is I'm no longer trying to be exhaustive. I think that's a very bad idea. So what I'm trying to bring out in these texts are some of the um, illustrative texts rather than to say that these are exhaustive. So I'm definitely not trying to be exhaustive. However, that pasuk, shafech dam ha'adam, ba'adam damo yishafech, is understood by a mechilta, is understood by one of the halachic um, Midrashim, which is contemporaneous with the Mishnah, so a really authoritative and high level um, reading of this text would be Shofech Dam Ha'adam Ba'adam. A person who kills, who spills the blood, sheds the blood of a person, which is in a person, Dam Ha'adam Ba'adam, the, dam, the blood of a person who is in a person, in that setting, Damoi Shofech. The um, result of that should be that that person's blood should be shed. Have I confused everyone or only some people? What are we extracting from that reading from the Mechilta? Yeah, essentially. So the, the reading of the Mechilta, and I'm going to note that that's disputed in the next line of the Mechilta because it would be too complicated if that was the only reading. But, Shofech dam ha'adam ba'adam. That's a reference to what is a fetus. A fetus would constitute something which is alive. That idea gets extended by the rumba. And this is a very famous rumba, which really forms the um, turning point in a whole lot of this. So actually, before we talk about the rumba, Daniel, I want to pause. What's been your experience um, engaging with people? How have they viewed the um, fetuses? How have they viewed their pregnancies? What relationship have they had to them? Um, oh, look, it definitely varies. Um, 
I think that um, some some women or couples uh, feel a connection to their to their unborn child the second that they wee on that stick and they see the second line um, and then from then on we are pregnant and we are having a baby some people it takes a little bit more time like for I think for a lot of, of pregnant women starting to feel those fetal movements can be a, a, a sort of really feeling that it's real um, it's often going to depend on what their psychosocial circumstances are in terms of how they perceive the pregnancy and um, if it is a wanted pregnancy, if it comes with many complications, if how well the mother um, is, what she's also dealing with as well. So I think it, I think it varies, um, but certainly I think generally if there is a connection that is developing to the child, that tends to grow with time. And some women don't actually feel a connection to their child at all until after the child is born. And even then, there is there is further further time that it takes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and which you know, I think is kind of understanding. You no, know, no one expects you to love instantly someone that you've never met. Um, so every, everyone experiences it differently. Um, so yeah, definitely lo lots of variation. Yeah, and one of the things that I find beautiful about Jewish texts, like in similar to that, is that you know what we're hearing is that people's lives and people's relationships are really different. And what I love about Jewish texts is that we're not saying that this is the way and this is the way that it is for everyone. It's like, no, we've got lots of texts in tension and, you know, we're trying to capture maybe all of the different sort of ways that people see and the different things that are happening in people's real life worlds rather than saying, you know, this is the way that it is. Absolutely. And I think that's a really, really good point because things that we don't always think about is, you know, um, some women I've seen experience, you know, the whole pregnancy as being one of guilt because their sister was never able to have children and in that in that circumstance the whole time they haven't really let themselves be happy because they feel this massive guilt for what they're able to to experience as opposed to others so and then there are situations where pregnancies unfortunately have come about as a result of violence and then there's you know massive internal conflict there um from from the situation and and what that means for them so absolutely really huge spectrum of, of um, what is experienced. Mm. So we'll keep looking at the rum bum and we'll try to move through this quite quickly. So this is one of the very, very key sources in this entire debate. I've put it on this side of the ledger because that's its simple understanding, but it's worth noting that people um, who come from the alternative position that life begins at birth work really hard to reinterpret this rum bum. We're not going to go into that because it's too much, but just keep it in mind that all of this, we're sort of doing a, um, you know, flyover from a thousand kilometres above. Like we're really skimming the surface with this. But the Rambam says, Harei zo mitzvah lo sase. It is a, one of the negative mitzvot, shelo lachus al nefesh harodeh, not to be, take pity, not to be merciful on a, the life of a pursuer. So this is a setting where, um, in a situation of pursuit, in a situation of rodef, there are three parties involved. The three parties are, there's a person who is trying to murder another person. And then there is a third person who is being instructed to intervene and prevent person A from murdering person B. So person C is being given an imperative to intervene and prevent the murder of person B by person A. And what the Rambam is telling us is that person C should not take mercy. Given that person A is trying to murder person B, person C, I think I'm doing really well to keep track of my A, Bs and Cs. You lost me at A. <laughs> I thought I was going to lose myself. <laughs> we get the situation, yeah? All right. So the Rambam is saying the, the mitzvah is not to, um, the, the person should not take mercy on. Now, as a result of that, let's move to thinking about a situation of a pregnancy. And the chachamim, the rabbis gave the instruction, that if you have a woman who is having a complicated, difficult birth, and difficult birth is being understood as a birth which is potentially putting the mother at risk, mutar it is permissible to um, cut, to 
here they've translated it as um, abort, the fetus, in the womb of the mother. Bain be some, bain be yad. Whether the um, abortion is going to occur through medication or whether the abortion is going to occur through the hand, i.e. through a knife, i.e. through some sort of surgical termination. So whether a medical termination is going to occur or a surgical termination is going to occur. Mipnei shehu karodef, because the fetus is going to be conceived as a rodef, as a pursuer, a hareha lahorga, pursuing after the mother in order to kill her. V'im mishehotzi rosho, however, that is only applicable while the fetus is within the womb. As soon as the birthing process starts, as soon as the head of the fetus starts to make its exit, a noginbo, a person is not allowed, is no longer allowed to intervene. A person is no longer allowed to attempt to abort that fetus, which is now crossed over and started to be born. She'ein dochin nefesh mipnei nefesh, because the imperative is that we should not be pushing aside one life for another life. One way of understanding this is, you know, um, one person's, who's, you know, why is one person's blood redder than another? Every person, you know, saving a life is important. However, not if it comes at the expense of another life. V'zel olam, and that is a very complicated conversation, which what exactly those words mean in context. We're not going to get into it. It translates as this is the way of the world. Yes. If it's uh, going to result in the mother's death, uh, being born, and then doctors or medical people know this, what happens then? Great question. So I think what we can extract from this rumbum are two core things. Number one is that a fetus is being considered as a rodef, i.e. a fetus is being given some sort of personhood in this conversation. Number two, that personhood is not being positioned as on the same level as the mother's personhood. There is being a preference, there's a preferential treatment being given to the mother's personhood over and above the fetuses. And therefore, in a situation like you've just described, not only is one permitted to engage in an abortion, one might understand as one would potentially, in certain circumstances, be instructed to. Because there's a preferential treatment of the mother's life or the future mother's life, the potential the woman's life over the fetus's life. So that's caught sort of the basic level understanding of the rumba. Is that all okay? Um, Dr. Daniel, I'm just wondering what you think of this. Like, I, it's, it's a difficult passage because it's hard to imagine that if Rumba were female, that he would have written this way. Like, giving this kind of malicious intent to the baby, like, I don't think any mother wants to think in such a difficult circumstance, my baby wants to kill me in like an evil, malicious, you know, murderous way. Like, that's, that's so hard. I mean, how do you come to this passage? Yeah, can we just repeat Thank the question you. for Zoom? Um, Solly's yeah. asked, how does Dr. Danielle, how does this passage make her feel? And the particular um, point in the question was more around um, the fetus is being positioned as a pursuer and how would a mother, a woman potentially see that and what would that do to her understanding of her fetus? So it's it's actually something we do see not infrequently. Um, the, I'll just, just, the issue here is what at what point does the fetus actually emerge? They're talking about the head coming through. Well, as anyone who's experienced a birth knows, the head coming down can take a very, very long time. So it's not so clear about that. So just putting that aside, um, there are many circumstances where um, the fetus is actually a risk, unfortunately, to the, to the mother's life. So the, a common, not uncommon example of this would be where um, the um, uh, a woman's waters break ahead of time, so like really, really premature. Um, so say even at the point where um, the baby, if it was born at that time, would not survive. So say something like maybe like <coughs> 19 weeks gestation, so just before um, five months. Um, and at that point, there can be a significant risk to the mother of continuing with the pregnancy because she can get overwhelming infection and very unwell. And so in that situation, sometimes there may be a decision needing to be made
investments um, where they have got that connection, it can be very, very hard. And likewise, in situations where there is, you know, severe, um, say, preeclampsia, like really bad blood pressure issues for, for the mother, um, because like really early on, and as a consequence, the, the baby's not thriving as well, and decisions may need to be made about that in order to preserve the mother's life. It's very hard. Um, can you rewind the clock back a bit to earlier stages in pregnancy, purely from a biological point of view, synthetics or a lack or whatever? Is there a time where the fetus is described as alive in the developmental biology sequence so that certain organs that have had to develop? I know the heart beats start really early, but mm, yeah. the biologists think of live or yeah, yeah, in that live or, or pre life. Yeah. yeah. So the question for those at home is is there a sort of biological um, time when one might be inclined to describe that this would be the start of life? And I think that the source that we saw last week, the source from Professor Dr. Gavram Steinberg, around how, in essence, that the same way that an end of life would be, yeah, so end of life, you know. There are certain um, qualities that people can look for, but at the end of the day, there needs to be some sort of um, spiritual metaphysical judgment as to when whatever we're seeing is described as alive or no longer alive. I think that would be um, transplantable to this conversation as well, because, you know, like heartbeat is something that people talk about, but why should a heartbeat necessitate that's the definition of life? Well, you know, because, you know, if I can sort of, play a trump card you know what we're talking about let's say is a soul when the soul goes in the body well when does that happen i don't have a soul meter you know <laughs> i've got a pulse oximeter but i don't have a soul meter yeah. so so when that happens you know which is another way, way of saying i know it's like but when is the halakhic definition of life starting is you know at least disputed is what we're seeing here mm. yeah um Solly also, you know, it was interesting. I feel like you might have read the Igris Moshe, which is something that Solly does on a regular Tuesday night, because the Igris Moshe addresses the question that Solly was describing. So just we'll go through it quite quickly. The Igris Moshe is a contemporary source, um, which we've encountered quite a few times in these series. And this is Rabbi Moshe Feinstein. And what he's saying is that um, just he follows the Rambam, and he's probably the main um and one of the more extreme manifestations of that Rambam potential understanding that life begins in utero. So he says, you know, what emerges from the Rambam is that harigat ubar with ritzicha mamash, that an abortion would constitute murder. And, and as a result, but mutar latoha ubar a person would be permitted to um, go through an abortion in order to save the mother. And this is the bit that um, is similar to what you were talking about, Solly. Okay. Even by um, taking the life of the pursuer, even though the pursuer is a minor, and even though the, this minor who is pursuing is pursuing the honest without any intention against its will. Hooray, desover, etc. et cetera. So I think what Ramosh is sort of referencing is that irrespective of the sort of um, con, con, um, considerations that you mentioned, what, what I think is being applied is a halachic definition of rodef, which is actually different. different. It doesn't, it doesn't have to have that malicious intent or it's just a reality where there is a risk that is being imposed on the woman's life. And, you know, if we think of it in sort of natural biological processes without any value judgment associated with it, it may be a little bit easier. And I think also something that in the medical field that you're going to consider is not only this index pregnancy, but the potential for future pregnancies and future fertility, um, because often these decisions relate to not only um, a woman's ability to continue this pregnancy in a healthy factor, but to have more children as well. Certainly. So, so to keep us moving, so that's that one sort of strand. And what's emerging from that um, is that termination of pregnancy, there are, according to all opinions, potential cases where um, a, a termination might be permissible. 
and might even be necessary or halakhically recommended, sort of if we go back to that earlier session that we had and talked about the spectrum of rabbinic responses, you know, rabbis don't often say, like, they're not saying yes, no, they're saying, you know, encourage, discourage, maybe, they're, they're really filling out that spectrum. But that's what's emerging, hopefully, from these sources. And maybe what we can um, notice as well is that this doesn't map onto the um, discourse that we might see in American life. You know, one of the impetuses, one of the reasons why people were interested in this Shiro series was like with um, the developments and the repeal of Roe v. Wade. And this is not the same conversation as what happens in America. This is a very different conversation, irrespective of which halakh positions people fall on. I hope that's emerging as we're talking as well. Yes. I don't know if I'm getting ahead of myself, but okay. um, you went on for it, let me know. But you talked a lot about um, the woman and the mum and her life. But in the case where, you know, I know that you, correct me if I'm wrong, you can find out quite early if something's wrong with the baby. So what happens in, in that case where Excellent. you know that the life is going to be affected of this child? Excellent. Can we get there? Yeah, We're definitely going to get there. <laughs> We're definitely, definitely going to get there. Um, one thing that I also want to mention is that, um, there's no notion of um, time that the Rumbum's imposing. Notice that the Rumbum's talking about just before the head emerges and then set the distinction arises when the head emerges. There's no sort of, you know, at first trimester, second trimester, third, like there's none of that sort of stuff. There's no dates that the Rumbum's imposing. It must um, have been Victorian. <laughs> <laughs> so another thing also is, you know, when we're talking about this, um, We've used words like um, woman's life is at risk. What does that mean? So, Danielle, maybe if you could share a few um, scenarios. So you've mentioned one about the, um, like the rupture of the membranes early, mm -hmm. but, but some situations of um, life being at risk and specifically um, doing some thinking because the one of the ways that the poiskin can say that an abortion is permitted is by taking a really liberal understanding of what a woman's life being at risk means. So you might say that risk is immediate danger right now. You know, there's a ruptured ectopic, for example. Or you might be able to zoom out and say that, well, if there's a possibility of risk down the line, that would also constitute and that would still fall under the banner of what's committed. And for full context, there are different questions, some of which say that, you know, mother's life at risk is the more extreme end, that it's, you know, a, a risk which is in front of us right now, which is quite... Um, pressing and others take a much more broad and you know conception of what risk is so in that sort of understanding maybe share a couple of examples um so i think certainly and particularly when we're talking about a lot of the time earlier terminations of pregnancy um there can often be a lot of focus on a woman's emotional and mental health um and that Sometimes a, a pregnancy can actually pose significant risk to, to um, a woman's health in that way, um, such that continuing with a pregnancy would be so destabilising to her, her mental health that it's, it's a significant concern. Mm. Um, thinking along the lines of the, the physical side of things, so an example that comes to mind would be um, the future risk that continuing with say for instance a multiple pregnancy and we're often talking about high order multiples like triplets or more um the uh, multiple pregnancies put significant risk not only on their the babies and their development and their when they're going to be born but also um increases the risk of a mother developing a whole lot of different complications um and there are sometimes considerations for say for instance triplets or higher order multiples something called fetal reduction so where you selectively um reduce the number of babies that that woman is carrying so to reduce her risk of complications in the pregnancy and thus together also reduce the risk of, um, to the babies as well. So it's kind of a bit of a symbiotic thing. They, they, it's difficult to talk about one without the other. Um, those are the examples that would come to mind. Is that kind of what you were thinking? Yeah. About? And, you know, for context, there are shutin, which is like rabbinic response are written on all of those examples. So, you know, you mentioned um, mental health considerations. Rav Moshe had a famous short from the 1950s where there was a woman who expressed significant mental health concerns in the context of a pregnancy. And the answer that was given to her was that a termination would be acceptable, even <coughs> according to one of the strict opinions, like Rav Moshe. 
um, you know, fetal reduction is something that a lot of the police can have discussed as well. And, you know, certainly um, is positioned as a mitigating factor. And, you know, I just feel like any time we're talking about um, specific answers to questions, you know, I just feel the obligation to highlight we're not doing that today either. We're sort of, um, you know, any individual case, this is like stuff that's way above my pay grade. And, um, yeah, Blake Street doesn't quite pay me enough. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, but, but what I'm trying to illustrate are some of the sort of ways of thinking and some of the ideas that the rabbis are encountering, but noting that, you know, specific answers to specific questions are way above our pay grade and not what we're able to engage with today. Yeah. From a medical ethics point of view, so not scientific, in the extreme circumstance of a chair present dangerous to the mother's life, is there a, a sort of medical ethical requirement to terminate? Just for the question for those at home. Leaving aside halacha for a minute, um, is there a medical ethics um, formulation of a requirement to terminate in situations of extreme risk to a mother? Um, not, not clearly. Um, I mean, it's always, it's not really answering the question, but those decisions are, are never made in isolation like it's never going to be something that a medical team will pursue it's always ideally in the situation of sort of discussion with the the family and what their ethical and cultural and understanding of, of the situation is so there isn't actually anything that dictates to us um, in terms of, of medical ethics what we need to do in specific situations no um, and flipping it again it can also be very tricky like say from a more of a legal standpoint in a situation say for instance where um a a mother is a, a woman is in labor and there is clear and present danger to her unborn child and you know their medical staff say for instance would really want to intervene to save the life of the child without without that woman's consent you absolutely cannot do anything and um, there have been situations unfortunately where um, that that unborn child has you know, suffered significant disability or even demise because in that situation very much um, the the person who is carrying the baby their their consent is absolutely paramount. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have a bit more question. If you don't want to answer it, then I understand. Um, I'm interested in your role also as a religious woman. Do you ever find yourself in situations where there's a conflict between maybe what you feel is the ethical approach, the right approach, and what kind of happened around you? I know it's kind of a. Mm -hmm. Did you want to repeat that for Zoom? So we yeah. Can... <laughs> Question um, for those at home is um, to Dr. Danielle Do you ever feel that there is a potential conflict between your religious identity and your religious values and your um, professional responsibilities um, expectations? Uh, look, there have definitely been times that um, I've I've grappled with certain situations um, and um, in cases where where I believe that I'm you know like my my training like I've been very very fortunate to to receive the training and the experience that I have and I believe that it's really really important to use that to support um, women and families um, in the safest and best way I can if there is such a situation such as that where I feel that I'm not able to um, to offer something that a family feel that they need for whatever reason it's whatever my reason may be then it would be my obligation to make sure that they have you know the best care um, that someone else can provide that care um, in replacement of that um, I do think though that certainly in these situations I've been fortunate to um, a lot of the people I have I have looked after have had their own um, pastoral council or religious council and that has been very helpful and I've learned a lot through the process in that way things are not always what you what you assume they would be like in terms of halakha in terms of the way that that things are, are decided and that's been that's been a big comfort um, but at the end of the day I you know I think it's really important that I that I walk with these women and families as as much as I can, as far as I can, um, and and support them. 
I was heard about the uh, angel to the mother. What about with medical science being so advanced today? If you can tell a child is going to be born with a severe disability, whether yes. a genetic one or a physical one in your life, what is the hell up and physical? Sure. So question for those at home. Um, we've heard a lot about the risk to the mother's life. What about um, risk in the sense of severe disability or genetic conditions? And I think the short answer to that is um, post-skim either who fall within the life begins in utero or who fall within the life begins at birth um, in certain situations and certain circumstances are permitting of a termination. Um, viability is a question that is one of the mitigating factors um, in the sense of for skin, if a fetus <coughs> is not likely to survive the pregnancy, then um, terminating earlier is, it, there's a potential mitigating factor that's at play if the fetus is not able to survive the pregnancy, partially because of risk that um, letting the fetus letting the pro, um, process progress, especially if a C-section will be needed at some later point. That's one of the mitigating factors in some point skin. Um, and in terms of disabilities, so there's a range of different approaches that are seen. Um, and I think that's applicable when I say there's a range of approaches amongst the post skin number one, and there's a range of post for a range with reference to dis different disabilities, number two. So it really is case specific, which I know doesn't necessarily answer, but um, that's, I think, the most honest answer is that it depends what we're talking about, depends who you ask. And, you know, a good place it should be factoring in all of these factors and also the individual situation that's in front of them, which is, you know, going back to the very beginning when we spoke about the difference between codes and between response to literature, that's what it's all about. It's about understanding the one person in front of me now. And if I can extend that, a lot of literature in this area is what we would call retail halacha as opposed to wholesale halacha. So when Rav Moshe is choosing to publish a shut in public, that's because he thinks that this responsa is applicable to the world. He wants to share it with the world. A lot of the literature in this area is individual conversations that people are having with the poisek, with their poisek. So it's not necessarily things that are being publicized in the same way because it's recognizing the individual case that's really before people, which I think is fascinating. And on the one hand, incredible because it's really, you know, patient centered, if you will. On the other hand, it's difficult because you get a different answer depending on who you ask. And you sort of have to know who to ask if you want certain answers. So there are certain barriers to entry from that. that this conversation operates in what some people might call retail rather than wholesale. Because of time, um, I'm going to fly through this next section, Life Begins at Birth. There is one conversation about a termination which occurs in the Torah, and that is in Shemot. And it's when two people are fighting and a woman, Venagfu um, Ishahara, and a pregnant woman is injured in the context of a fight that two people are having. The Yatsu Yuladeha and the um, a miscarriage results is how they translate. The um, Loyihia Ason. And there is no, how do we translate Ason? Anyone know? Tragedy. Nothing terrible happened. Okay? There is no tragedy. Here they've translated it as a miscarriage, but I don't like that translation. There's no tragedy. Anosh Yanesh, there should be a punishment which is incurred. Kashe Yashid Allah Bal Haisha. Um, and that needs to be paid to the woman's husband. Um, but if there is some sort of tragedy, and there should be a um, soul for a soul. What can we extract from this halacha? So we've got a woman, the woman is pregnant, the woman is collateral damage in a fight, and the way that's first being positioned is there is no asod, and in that situation, there needs to be a monetary payment. And then the second way that it's positioned is there is an asson, there is a tragedy. And in that situation, there needs to be some sort of nefesh tacha nefesh, um, blood for blood, um, soul for soul. Okay? Now, what is a tragedy? So I think this is really important because this is also where the Christian dialogue spins off from the Jewish dialogue. 
Because in the Jewish tradition, an ason, a tragedy, is interpreted as, as Rashi says in the next source, the death of the woman. A tragedy is constituted as the death of the woman. And in the event of the death of the woman, that's when nefesh tachat nefesh, i.e. in the event of the death of the fetus, monetary payments, monetary payments, i.e. the fetus is not being positioned as a human life. That's the Jewish dialogue. Christian dialogue for a second. Ason is a miscarriage. Sorry, ason is a termination. The fetus is the ason. I.e., a fetus is being positioned as a life. And nefesh tachat nefesh is the death of the fetus. And I think that's a really important because there's no definition of what the word ason, tragedy, means. We obviously understand it, you know, in line with Rashi, in line with all of our other traditions, that ason is by definition, the way that we're understanding it, with reference to the death of the mother, which is then positioning a termination very much as not a murder. Is that okay? That sentiment is followed in this Mishnah where it talks about a woman who's having trouble giving birth and we are able to terminate the pregnancy because her life needs to become before the life of the fetus. And then that doesn't apply if the fetus has started to emerge. So what we're seeing there is that the mother's life does need to come before the fetus's life, but it's more general than that. It's that a fetus is not being positioned as a, a person. A fetus does not have personhood. I think let's flip the page. Just because a fetus doesn't have personhood, and this is where we can maybe go back to the pro-choice, pro-life and see that we're positioning a different discourse. It's not that if a fetus isn't a life, therefore a termination is under all situations halakhically acceptable. That's not what we're saying. There are sort of three categories of issues that are potentially identified by the rabbis that a termination would encounter. And I think what this is sort of getting us to say is that there are some sort of broader ethic at play independent of murder. There's something else going on. If it's not murder, what is it? Okay, but then we need to talk about what other options there are. So we can talk about the mum and we can talk about that a person doesn't have, um, that a, a termination would constitute um, wounding or, you know, um, chabala is like the Hebrew for it, wounding or injuring the mother. And that would be saying that, you know, the fetus would be yerech imor, like similar to a limb of the mother. And just like a person isn't able for any reason to wound themselves, so too a termination would require some sort of reason, but not a reason that is on the same level as justifying a life. So there are sort of broader ethics that are at play. You know, and a good example in a different setting, to, not to make a comparison, but just to sort of get this into people's minds, would be the halakhic conversation around plastic surgery. What do we think halakha says about plastic surgery? Unnecessary risk. Unnecessary risk. However, in certain settings, plastic surgery would be permitted by various places. You mean cosmetic surgery? Cosmetic surgery. Because plastic surgery is cosmetic. where there's... Sorry. Sorts of other yeah, yeah. Cosmetic, cosmetic surgery. Sorry. Yes. Cosmetic surgery. So, what I'm trying to motivate it with that question is the idea that according to these alternative conceptions, you, there's, it's still operating within what we might call a justification framework. There's still a thinking that, you know, there, are, that there needs to be a reason. And it needs to be, you know, a good reason, let's even say, but it doesn't need to be life-saving of the mother. And then the definition of what a reason, a good reason, differs depending on which posting you ask. Is that all okay? And the sort of emblematic view amongst the um, poiskim of that in the contemporary sense is that Tzitz Eliezer, who we also encountered previously, like we mentioned, he was the main poisk of Kshar Tzedek Hospital, and he is sort of the main advocate, and he says, Shekol shelo yatsala abir haolam, and shem nefeshala. Any fetus which has not entered into the world does not have the definition of a soul on it, does not, is, isn't defined as being alive. 
But that doesn't mean that he would then say that, you know, a termination in every setting is applicable, but it does mean that in certain settings, he would say that a termination, um, he, he would give his halachic vouching for that. Is that okay? Um, I think, let's just breathe for a second. Let's just breathe. Are we all okay? Do we sort of get where we're up to so far? All right, let's get to some of those practical considerations. And Danielle, before we sort of get into that, like, you know, we're talking about reasons that people might terminate. And I think, you know, that's getting to a deeper conversation that there's a lot going on when a person's making a decision to terminate. And what are your experiences caring for women who are dealing with potentially difficult pregnancies or difficult decisions around their pregnancy? Um, I think that it definitely comes back to their, where they are in their life and in their social family everything circumstances so um every you know every wanted pregnancy is precious but um a 45 year old who's had 10 years of ivf and this is their first pregnancy and they're dealing with a a, a fetal abnormality it's a different situation from um a 22 year old who is going through a really really difficult psychiatric recovery and at the moment could not cope with a pregnancy but has a reproductive career ahead of them. Um, so I think that that taking that into context is, is very important. Um, what I think a lot of the time is really, really difficult for um, women and pregnant people and couples is the unknown and the waiting. Um, a lot of the time, say for instance, if we're dealing with um, a suspected fetal abnormality, there may be screening and there may be testing and there is there is waiting to know and waiting for the next test and waiting a little bit more information. And then also sometimes we can screen for certain genetic abnormalities and they can come up um, and be tested for and be positive. But what that would mean for that baby is very variable. So, um, and also we're asking sometimes, you know, young, young couples to think, okay, potentially yes I can I can look after a two-year-old with with a disability it's 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 you know effectively a baby with extra needs but when I leave when I pass on my my other children what's that going to mean for them they're going to they're going to be looking after this person who is highly dependent and those kind of things it's all of these factors that I think come into play not just the very short and medium term plus also the timeline in which women who are experiencing a difficult pregnancy have to make their decisions. So up until a certain point, if they're choosing to terminate their pregnancy, there is the option of, um, like we talked about, a surgical termination where they can go to sleep. But after a relatively early period of time, and we're often talking even 14, 15 weeks, to terminate a pregnancy at that point um, will often involve actually going through labour. Um, so an induction of labour of sorts, um, because the access to a surgical termination is quite quite limited um, at that point. So the, as you can imagine, the um, the emotional strain and experience of going through that is is quite significant. Um, yeah. And you know, it, it's like interesting that like to hear you describe. And, and you know, I did some research into what are the um, specific considerations that post are factoring in. And like, it's interesting, you know, to hear you, because like, they're quite similar in, in what considerations are being factored in, even if um, the approach towards them might be slightly different and how they're using them might be slightly different. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so like, for example, you know, types of abortion, there's a halakhic preference for a medical over a surgical um, and for earlier rather than later. Um, not for the same reasons in terms of that a woman would therefore have to go through labour because of the halakhic me mechanics of it are quite complicated, but essentially um, that preference does emerge and Poiskim would be aligned with saying that. And it's just interesting, like, um, whether, yeah, how um, those situations arise. I just find that quite interesting. Yeah, I, I wonder whether, um, from my experience, I think there is also the consideration that, that Poiskim have for for like future pregnancies and future fertility. So um, we know that say for, for a surgical termination, um, there are, I mean, look, there, there are risks both ways, but there are, there are certainly risks for say a situation where a woman needs to have repeated 
um, surgical procedures. There are risks for her sometimes ability to carry a term pregnancy in the future. Not always, but sometimes. Um, so that can be a consideration. I think it's also to do with, um, depending on the gestation, what can actually happen with um, with the with the body of the fetus as well and in terms of offering it um, sort of a, a burial uh, surgical as opposed to medical as well that's a consideration in halakha too I think yeah. Yeah. yeah so let's race through a few of the considerations we sort of touched on some of the maternal um, factors previously um, just to sort of spell them out you know you can have issues that are relating to the pregnancy itself you can have issues that are anyone else might encounter, which aren't specifically related to the pregnancy, but occur at the same time as the pregnancy. You know, if a woman, for example, you know, you can get a new diagnosis of a cancer and then have to be thinking about chemotherapy. And that just happens to be at the same time when a person is carrying a baby. Um, the other thing I think that's worth stating out loud is that both can factor in the will of the woman, what's her desire. Is she interested in continuing to carry this pregnancy or is she interested in not? Um, I think that's an important thing. Um, we've sort of mentioned it before, but mental health, um, it was really, and it's within a lot of our lifetimes, which is pretty amazing that um, mental health has been transposed into the same category as physical health. And a lot of the leniencies or halakhic mechanics that apply to physical health are really in our lifetime now understood to apply to mental health as well. And I think that's, you know, an amazing um, development and important development. You know, we had Rabbi Yoni here talking and he's continuing that work. But um, I think there's still a long way to go in that space. But, you know, the conversation is starting to happen, which is great. We mentioned also viability. Um, and uh, we don't have time to get into specifics of the genetic conditions and disabilities, but know that that is something that posts can do take into account. Another thing also is um, the timing of the pregnancy. Um, 40 days is sort of, there's a phrase that, you know, before 40 days, a fetus would constitute maya the alma, so like fluid. Um, what exactly that means and then what this is before 40 days. It's not a blanket, you know, anything is acceptable before then, but it is a significantly mitigating factor. And I think it's worth noting that the way that um, halacha counts dates and the way that, you um, like medicine count dates are actually different. So halakha is counting dates from conception, whereas medicine is counting dates from the date of the last menstrual period, which tends to, in, on average, be, let's call it two weeks before. So 40 days is really 54. Um, that's just something to sort of be aware of, that people often have a little bit more time than they thought they might have had to at least utilise that potential heter. And, and, and the way that I want people to be thinking about these things is it's not like this is good enough reason, that's not good enough reason. It's that the post are factoring in all of these complicated features of people's lives. And this is a non-exhaustive list, you know, and they're really thinking about this individual person, everything's going on. And I think it's also worth noting that there's a second conversation, which is about what a person chooses to do with the information, whether a person chooses to seek out a post number one and number two what a person chooses to do with the response that they receive from a place number two so there's like a step two in all of this conversation of how this relates to real people's individual lives which isn't the same thing as what it says in a book or what someone told them um, a couple of other ones you know we've sort of spoken about fetal reduction and multiple pregnancies um, we've spoken about medical versus surgical in terms of types of abortion um, in these other ones you know, you can read them. If a woman is weak or unwell, that's a mitigating factor. If a woman is presently nursing, that's a mitigating factor. Um, demographics, you know, if the child is likely is going to be a mum's error, that's a mitigating factor as well. If the um, pregnancy has occurred in the context of a rape or, you know, which doctor is available to do the termination is also a, mid a potential consideration as well. So there's a lot going on there, but just sort of just to run through the, you know, that's a list and there's plenty that are not on that list. And it's a really case by case individual um, experience in terms of seeking out a post-ex guidance. Um, to end that considerate question, like um, these are considerations that rabbis are dealing with. Are you able to provide us with some insights into the considerations that your patients maybe are dealing with? Like, are they sort of similar to this, very different to this? Oh, very similar. <laughs> yeah. Um... I think that um, in particular to sort of add another layer of complexity to that is the, the constantly evolving um, medical sphere in terms of what we can do and what we do know about, say, for instance, things like 
um, diagnosing, managing um, genetic and medical conditions and what that can mean um, in terms of like a life. Also, even things around viability. I mean, we, we now, uh, in some situations, will actively resuscitate babies at 22 weeks. Whereas, you know, if it's a few it was four weeks, so then the that definitely um, comes into consideration as well as, um, yeah, I think access, access to services too, and that's something that is very location specific. Um, and that's something we, we are very much considering when we are counselling women about with their decision making in terms of, okay, what impact would this have on you if you needed to pursue a termination and you can only pursue it a medical termination, not a surgical, and, and those kind of factors. Um, also, I think counts what's really important in any when we're doing any screening, say like um, genetic screening or, or pregnancy antenatal testing, is pre test counseling. Like before we do any of these tests, what will you do with the results? because it's one thing to do the test, but then you really need to have an idea about, because things come up that you haven't thought about before, such as conditions that, you know, any of us could be walking around with those conditions and it wouldn't impact us at all, but some of us would be affected. And then if you don't know that, would that how would have that influenced you? So it's, it's, it's quite complex um, and yeah, lots of things to consider. And like I think it's also worth noting that um, when we've talked about um, Poiskim and rabbis, like the texts that we've quoted here have spanned thousands of years. The most recent text I've quoted is the final text, but with the exception of um, Rabbi Wida, the most recent text before that, you know, Tzitz Eliezer was, um, he, I think 2006 was when he passed away. And Rabbi Moshe, you know, passed away in the 80s. Like, uh, so much has changed in this, in a lot of medical areas, but, you know, in this area, like we're hearing, and, and what's, I think, really important is that the sorts of responses that people were receiving, you know, 10 and 20 years ago, if we're talking about milk with pots and fleshic spoons, not that much has changed unless you talk about induction cookware. But with the exception of that, like not that much changes that quickly. And so, Bruce, this is an area because of all of the innovation um, and because, you know, things that were taken to be absolutely definitely one way and now, you know, actually a fetus at a totally different age is now considered viable, that needs to be reflected in the post skin as well. So absolutely. And if we also look at the, like, the fertility sphere, like what do we do with embryos that have been created mm -hmm. and aren't going to be used? That, whole, that opens a whole other... Totally. Yeah, we totally. didn't have that many yeah. years ago. Yeah, and, you know, genetic yeah. counselling you mentioned, like the, the, this idea that you don't get told that a fetus definitely is going to have ABC. You get told that there's a likelihood and this is the likelihood. Well, what does that mean? And how does halakha make sense of that? That's a conversation that if you look to the previous text, they didn't explicitly address. They're like relatively contemporary conversations that need to be had and are sort of being had presently. And I think, you know, Rabbi Weed is a really interesting um, insight into the contemporary world. So he talks about the law of natural selection of Poiskin. He's a Rosh Shiver at YU. And what he means by the law of natural selection of Poiskin is also, um, that's from a podcast that I've sort of referenced, which I thought was great. Um, if people are interested in listening to it, um, highly recommend. It's from the same sort of podcast um, as the one that I quoted at the very beginning. The podcast is Orthodox Conundrum. I think Rav Noam's rabbi was the, yeah, Rav Scott Kahn, um, Jewish Coffee House. Give him a free plug. He gives himself a lot of plugs in this podcast. <laughs> Anyways, um, Rabbi Weida talks about the law of natural selection of poiskim. And what he's getting to there is that a poisek is someone who a person comes to with a question. And people choose who they go to with questions. And in that setting, big poiskim are rarely machmiric. Big poiskim are rarely incredibly strict because people don't tend to keep repeat returning to the person who's going to give them incredibly strict answers. They go to people who they feel, you know, understand the complexities of their situation and scenario. If you are incredibly machmir, people stop coming back to you. Um, you might be the god or hador, you might be the most knowledgeable person in the generation, but if no one's turning up to see you, then you're not necessarily the poisek hador anymore. 
The reality is, and this was an interesting insight for me, that the way that um, Rabbi Weeder and the circles that he surrounds himself in and the people that he knows, he says that most prominent poskim today in Israel and America are relatively lenient with reference to abortion. They permit terminating in a range of situations that go beyond the Kuach Nefesh. And I think, you know, when we're talking about those two strands, it's worth just sort of noting that, um, at least from Rabbi Weeder's perspective, in a contemporary setting, that, you know, while we certainly have all of these incredible values about bringing children into the world and about um, not terminating pregnancies where possible, that the range of scenarios where postmen are willing to terminate, um, uh, are willing to... Um, say that it's acceptable to terminate a pregnancy is a lot wider than people might think. It's not situations just of pikuach nefesh. And, you know, especially as we see like discourses in America and even in Australia in some settings as well, like we don't fit into those boxes. Doesn't matter how you make it all work. Do you want to jump in? I think he said it really well. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think any questions at that point? Yes. You, you asked it. Oh, that's great. And that could make one of the questions I asked earlier about when does life begin? And you talked about the Maya de Alma, mm -hmm. so I understand to me just water mm -hmm. uh, as being less than 40 days. So mm -hmm. if you go to the conventional counting, that's 54 mm -hmm. days, about uh, seven and a half. Days. Yeah, but I do want to say that that's not the only source that's relevant to that conversation. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that's the time that the rabbis impute the neshama? Or does the neshama only come into um, play after birth? The reason I ask this is there's a, there's a passage in, from the time of Tukka, which is great. I can't remember what the phrase is, but one of the commentaries I read about who shall live and who shall die it talks about abortion was not ever passing into the world. I think it's the Maori. They pass through the world without mm. actually being part of it. Mm. So they 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 have a special status mm. in this view of in the Lord of the Shema, whatever that yeah. is. Yeah. So question about for, for those at home is relating to when an Ashama would enter the body. And I think, you know, um what I think we also have a middle category that references this idea of, you know, I'm gonna call it partial personhood where you know and if we go to those reasons up the top you know for example one of the ways that rabbis say that um one of the issues might go back to your stealing life from the fetus it's not alive now but there's the potential for life soon and similarly you know you're preventing the fetus from keeping shabbos or the commandments so it's not to say that there's a termination of a life it's to say that there's some other more ephemeral concept and other broader value that's, you know, there's another reference there to your, um, there's a prevention of the creation of a life, you know, so there's all of these like, not life, but something else. And there's something in between. And I think that's, you know, there's really, it's a really complicated discourse. You know, I didn't bring it, but there's a Tosavist, which on the simple reading says that there's no issue with the termination. Like all of our sources, there's so many different sources that are saying part of the picture and you need Poiskin to put all of those parts of the picture together. There's a question. Um, yeah, it's hard to aim for like a pretty sense around for, um, say, a, a, a pregnant individual um, in a coma to be kept on the ship for the sake of like, the fetus. Um, yeah, that is a fascinating question. So the question is, are there any halakhic precedents for a fetus to be kept, um, for, for a fetus whose mother is comatose to be kept alive um, to prevent, to facilitate the birth? Um, the most, the first thing that's flashing up in my head is there's a Gemara which talks about the need to break Shabbos um, to save, to, to, to do a, a cesarean on a woman who has um, collapsed and has um, the understanding from the reading of the sources that has died. And there's a need to do a, um, you break Shabbos to do, to, to do the C-section, to bring the child into the world, even though 
it's hard to understand exactly why in terms of if it's not alike and what is it all that side of things so i think um you know that's a specific question that i think is above my pay grade but certainly you know the way that i understand that source is that that would be a reason to um at least you know take steps to facilitate the life of the fetus from halakhic grounds i think yeah jaffa was that a question no it's all right were any other questions in the crowd? No. All right. Um, Can I actually just say something real quick? Yeah, Rob, no one would like to say something really quick. Yeah. Hi, everyone at home. Just want to take the opportunity to, uh, to thank uh, Dr. Danielle for joining us this evening. It's been uh, really wonderful. Thank you for having me. Yeah, our pleasure. Uh, and you've kind of presented things in a very clear and sensitive and knowledgeable way. So you're, it's, it's really been, I think, appreciated by everyone. Thank you so much for making time. I'm sure you're very, very busy schedule to join us this evening. I also want to take this opportunity to, to thank Rabavi, or like Dr. Avi, uh, for the past four Monday nights. It's been a really, really wonderful you guys see me at home? I want to make sure that a uh, really wonderful series. I'm sure we could do this for many, many more, but the idea here is to give, you know, four weeks and then uh, very soon, as scary as it is, we're going we're gonna to jump into an Elul series as we prepare for Tishrei, also a four-week series, uh, so stay tuned for that. Uh, but Rebab, you put a lot of really hard work into this and preparing everything very, uh, very clearly, very beautifully and delivering very sensitively and also very knowledgeably as well. So big shout out to lots of people tuning in online tonight as every night and a great crowd here as well. So big shout out to you and a round of applause. Right now. <laughs> I'll just give two, two quick more plugs. Uh, so tomorrow night, we're starting a, a monthly meditation, Jewish meditation series. So if you're interested in exploring Jewish meditation, we're going to do it once a month. That'll be tomorrow night, uh, Tuesday. And of course, this Motzei Shabbat Sunday, uh, we've got Tisha B'Av, uh, barring any unforeseen uh, uh, shifts. Uh, but we've got a very, very packed uh, schedule of speakers, a very meaningful ways to engage in Tisha B'Av. So we'll see you all then. Once again, we check off to, to Rabavi and Dr. Danielle. Thank you so, so thank much you. for joining us. Thank you all, guys. Have a good evening. <laughs>